Hello, everyone. In this video, we're going to conclude our conversation on Othello now that we've addressed most of the content of Act 5. In order to understand what Shakespeare's trying to do here, however, we need to look at some background information regarding the genre of tragedy as it has been classically understood by looking at a particular definition of tragedy or a particular conception of the tragic worldview. There are many, but this is one of them. And then discussing essentially views on literature, art, and the stage that have dominated Western discourse on the arts. First, Othello encapsulates a particular perspective on tragedy, and that is the character himself. He says after he wounds Iago, rather than killing him, that I am not sorry neither. I'd have thee live, for in my sense, tis happiness to die. That is an encapsulation, a reflection of the tragic universe, the nature of the universe that exists inside a work of tragedy, like Othello or Macbeth or Oedipus Rex. In short, the universe of a tragedy is also captured, or it's also reflected in the statement from the book of Ecclesiastes, a book of wisdom literature from the Christian and Hebrew Bibles. Now, the speaker in this book says, I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. Wherefore, I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they, which hath not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. If you want the most simple and direct encapsulation of the nature of a tragedy, it is this. That in a tragedy, or in the universe of a tragedy, the lucky ones die young, and the luckiest are never born. Because, well they've been able to escape all the misery that would be their lives. Now, in the most famous definition or formal definition of tragedy that we have, Aristotle in his Poetics lays out the characteristic elements that help to create a work of tragedy, the aspects that need to be included in order to produce the most effective tragic work. He says that one of these elements, we're not going to go into detail about all of them, but one of them is the reversal, that there needs to be a reversal of circumstances surrounding the individual and contextualizing that reversal of circumstances from positive to negative is ultimately a series of reversals of expectation and intention. The example that he draws upon from Oedipus Rex, a famous play from his own era, is Oedipus having this uh, kingly authority over the city that he rules only to learn something that completely changes his view of his life. He learns that the woman that he has married is actually his mother and that he has had this incestuous union with her. And that realization leads to his destruction. Now, he didn't know that it was his mother. He married her completely unwittingly. And he had tried to avoid any kind of impropriety. But he meets the destiny that he was fated to have on the very road that he took to try to avoid it. He tried to avoid um, sinning against the gods and blaspheming against them. But in the end, unwittingly, he did just that. So on the road that he took to escape that monstrous fate, he actually met it. That's a reversal of intention, and it leads to the reversal of circumstances from high, he's a king, to low, he is a blind beggar. There are also a series of reversals in worldviews. Right? There's some kind of dramatic recognition of your actual status in the world. Oedipus thinks that he is a morally upright man and not a good king, but it turns out, well, he was sleeping with his own mother. He was this morally degenerate individual that was condemned by the gods, and yet he never knew it. And the recognition of his true relationship with the woman that he believed was his lawfully wedded wife completely reorients his perspective on the world and his circumstances. So reversals are a characteristic and defining element of tragedies. We only need to look at Othello to find more examples of it. Right? Cassio has this reversal of his own circumstances and a reversal of intention when in his attempt to defend his honor against the slights of Rodrigo, he actually loses his honor. Now, these reversals continue on into Act 5 of Othello, when Othello recognizes what he has done. He's had that recognition of his actual relationship with Desdemona, that Desdemona was truly faithful to him, and that the man he believed was his friend, Iago, was in fact his tormentor. And that leads to the reversal of the circumstances. He is crow crowing in victory. He believes that he has actually um, destroyed his enemy, when in reality, he's destroyed everything that he loved. That's one aspect of the tragedy, recognition and reversal. Keep these in mind. We're going to discuss some other background material, and we're going to tie together these two threads about the genre of tragedy 
and the perspective on literature and art as a whole when we finish off our conversation on Othello in just a few minutes. But keep this idea about tragedy in the back of your minds. Perspectives on literature, and this is going to seem like an, an aside that isn't entirely relevant, but you'll see how it works through the rest of the play and how it ties with the genre of tragedy as Shakespeare is sort of imagining it and using it. Literature, theater, and poetry have oftentimes fallen under censure and critique by philosophers and statesmen. Oftentimes, these critiques are uh, focused on three areas. It's been suggested that literature and theater are debased in that they are functionally lies. You're going into the theater to watch people pretend to lie about being somebody that they're not. Now that seems rather strange to us, but um, the notion of deception and um, intrigue that surrounds theater and literature and art has been a, a popular element or a common element inside invectives levied against the very form. Okay. So it has this stigma of deception surrounding it. Many critics of theater and literature have also suggested that these works of art inflame the passions. As you sit and watch Othello destroy everything he loves and destroy himself and then commit suicide, you are moved to these excesses of emotionalism. And surely, the critics would say, this is unhealthy. You are being trained to feel improperly. You're responding to deception and lies with a genuine emotional response that is unhealthy. And it is an excessive emotional response. You're being moved to tears by the, the sight on the screen. Surely, this is making you less able to regulate and control your own emotional experience. It's inflaming the passions. Or if there's something lurid or seductive about the material that's being presented, you're being encouraged to a kind of licentiousness. Now, other critics have picked this up. For instance, in his confession, St. Aug Augustine said this of the theater in his younger days, the theater enraptured me for its shows were filled with pictures of my own miseries and with tinder for my fires. So I saw pictures of my own miseries. I saw things that made me weep and made me feel tragedy and made me feel self-pity. But also it had tinder for my own fires. So it's, it kindled within me these unhealthy passions and desires. Why is it that a man likes to grieve over doleful and tragic events which he would not want to happen to himself? The spectator likes to experience grief at such scenes, and this very sorrow is a pleasure to him. What is this but a pitiable folly? For the more a man is moved by these things, the less free he is from such passions. So you're trapped by your passions when you actively stoke them, when you seek out those stimuli in fiction or in theater that contribute to those passions or cause you to feel them uncontrollably. However, when he experiences it, it is usually caused misery. When he experiences it with regards to others, it is called mercy. But what sort of mercy is to be shown to these unreal things upon the stage? The auditor is not aroused to go to the aid of others. He is only asked to grieve over them. Augustine goes on to say, In the theaters I rejoiced with lovers when they wickedly enjoyed one another, though this was imaginary only in the play. So he's saying, I saw these spectacles of unchaste desire, these lovers on the stage, and it, behave, it caused me to behave or to think wickedly. And so theater, the arts, there's something that inflame the passions that inspire negative thoughts and negative actions. Okay. So these are two of the common criticisms that are levied against theater or art. And I would argue that Shakespeare in Othello is developing a defense against these accusations. And we can better understand this defense by examining one levied by Sir Philip Sidney in his defense of Posey. Um, Posey essentially just means poetry, but he's speaking about literature generally. So responding to the critics of literature and poetry, philosophers and moralists and the like, Sir Philip Sidney says this, comparing nature and imagination that is instantiated in art. Nothing but nature has produced so valiant a man as Orlando, or so right a prince as Xenophon Cyrus, and so excellent a man in every way as Virgil's Aeneas. The artist's imagination worketh not only to make a Cyrus, which had been but a particular excellency, as nature might have done, but to bestow a Cyrus upon the world to make many Cyruses, if they will learn all right why and how the, that maker made him. So, he's saying that there is no greater example of virtue as Aeneas, or no greater example of an excellent prince as Cyrus. Nature has wrought them, and no imagination could ever conceive them. However, the artist's imagination 
creates not just a single Osiris. Instead, the purpose of art and the purpose of depiction of the depiction of a moral individual in art is to educate, to teach and train others how they might emulate the virtue that is depicted. Nature creates a singular exemplar, a single man, but I can't be that man. However, the artists can imagine and construct a Cyrus to make many Cyruses. If we examine the character of that Cyrus, the fictional person who is constructed by the artist or by the author, then I can learn how to behave better myself. I can learn how to be a better man by looking at how this good man was created in the context of fiction. That, Sidney is saying, is the very purpose of fiction, that is to give us exemplars to follow. Now, there are other defenses and reasons that we should embrace poetry that are advanced by various other philosophers, artists, and authors. Shakespeare has his own perspective, and it's tied to this, about the uh, ability to replicate or to emulate the narratives and the lives of the heroes and good men that we see depicted for us on the stage. The play Othello is, I would argue, a protracted exploration of storytelling and this conflict between different perspectives on the value or the destructive potential of literature, art, and the theater. He presents to us these metatheatrical shows. Metatheaters, we've said, or metatheatrical moments, are just those instances in the play when it reveals itself as fiction. It reminds us that the characters on the stage are really actors, they start behaving as actors, they start using the conventions of theater. Okay. Now, the meta performances inside um, stories oftentimes break it down. It reminds us that we're watching actors, we're watching real people on the stage who are just playing roles. So it, it breaks down the fictionality. It encourages us not to view things as fictional, but to look at the actors themselves, the reality behind the roles that they're playing. Stories and those metatheatrical stories that Iago constructs inside this play do the exact opposite with characters. They encourage characters to embrace false narratives. Remember what Iago did from the very first scene of the play, when he encouraged Brabantio through his performance by orchestrating events like the director of the play giving Rodrigo his lines, and encouraged Brabantio to view Othello through the lens of stereotype. Right? This is a savage black man stealing your, your daughter. This is a, this is a, a cursed, damned, devilish slave. It's all couched in stereotypes, these reductive visions that distant people from the reality of who Othello actually was as a unique, vibrant, and noble individual. So Iago's stories, and explicitly his metatheatrical moments, distance characters from the realities of their own universe. It's almost as if Shakespeare is presenting to us in miniature through Iago all the worst critiques of storytelling and theater. Theater inflames unnatural passions, which is exactly what Iago's stories do. Right? He puts on that play when he has a conversation with Cassio and has, Ia uh, has Othello watch as a substitute audience. He inflames Othello's jealousy and passion and rage, and those passions lead him to conduct the most abhorrent of actions. So we have here in Shakespeare this depiction of the worst um, excesses and the worst examples of storytelling. However, Shakespeare, through the genre conventions of tragedy, is advancing a defense of poetry, defense of storytelling, in order to counteract Iago's narrative. The stories that Iago tells reduce objects, events, and peoples to types or stereotypes. Right? Remember Othello's lament, alas to make me a fixed figure for the scorn of time. I don't want to be a type. I don't want to be uh, just a type of person. I want to be an individual with all the complexity and all the, um, the positive and negative attributes that that implies. In so doing, Iago forms a kind of separate distant narrative. Desdemona is a whore. Cassio is a usurper in all spheres, public and private. And Othello is an animal. That's the series of stories that he wants to construct. A series of stories that are designed to present these false realities. Iago's theatrical productions reduce the richness and complexity inherent to the true narrative and the characters in Othello. His theatrical games and his stagings, either in themselves or in their consequences, poison and reduce individuals to their base animal natures and drives and robs them of all their fundamental human attributes, skills, and complexities. He robs them of their language and assimilates it into himself. He robs them of their dignity. 
or at least tries to. However, this play in its entirety is a kind of prolonged test of Iago's wits, and he fails that test spectacularly. In that last scene, he himself is reduced to pure impotent animal violence, striking out against his wife, whom he can no longer control. Obviously control unjustly. Um, and he no longer has that kind of uh, defining speech and reason that gave him such power. He said, I work by wit and not by witchcraft. Now he can't work by wit. It's all gone. All he has to work with is violence. Shakespeare does not allow any of his characters, Desdemona, Cassio, Othello, and Iago, to be reduced to fixed figures. Instead, he embraces the inherent complexity of the human condition, the irreducible complexity of the human condition. Remember that popular conceptions of devilry in the middle of the Middle Ages to the Renaissance oftentimes depended on external signs. Othello himself draws attention to those when he says, when he looks down at his feet, no, that's just a fable. He's looking for the goat legs, these stereotypical physical external signs of devilry. In line 284, I look down towards his feet, but that's a fable. If that thou beest a devil, I cannot kill thee. So he looks at Iago's feet and he says, I don't see the external signifiers of devilry. So Shakespeare takes that uh, common external signifier of devilry, just like that common external signifier of blackness, and says, no, there's no match between what we think of in terms of externalities and the internal realities that people have. Othello, though black, is fair, as it is said of him by one of the assembled senators. And Iago is a white devil with all of his associations with hell as he calls upon the divinities of hell to work his, his quote unquote wit. These failures of correlation between internal realities and external signifiers are a way of Shakespeare exploring the complexity of the human condition. And all these characters resist reductive readings, the kinds of reductive readings that Iago attempts to impose upon them. This play ends with praise for Othello. Lodovico, Grantano, and Montano recognize that he was great of heart. He may be, as Iago points out, much changed with my poisons, but he is, at the end, a fully human being as he tries to kill the animal part of himself, because it is only in that act of self-renunciation that we can find our true humanity. As a fully human being, he's defined by change, by his ability to change. He has the capacity, like any man or woman, for greatness and cruelty, justice and injustice. And the commingling together of these attributes in Othello refutes a unified reading of his character as either noble or savage. And Iago himself, with his constantly shifting motives, each proving false, each being exploded by the narrative in turn, might be considered inconsistent to the point that we can't identify any persistent and logical motivation for his actions at all. He assumes the role of a preacher of the Logos, Christ, and reason, and the devil. And his language has, at the beginning, the potential to be the most fundamentally uh, potent force in the play, the ultimate power therein, but at others to be absolutely worthless, as he can't even use it to cow his own wife. He is a fundamentally protean, changeable, shifting character. Consequently, Shakespeare reveals that Iago's internality is irreducible and incomprehensible, as oftentimes it is true for most people. His villainy cannot be neutralized by ascribing his actions to the motivations of ambition, sexual jealousy, spite, or even racism. The fluidity of his nature, the inconstancy of his motivations, the impenetrability thereof, saves the master of reductive storytellings to any simple reductive narrative that we can seek to impose upon him. We can't say he did what he did out of jealousy, he did what he did out of racism. No, there's something fundamentally incomprehensible about the character, and Shakespeare leaves that ambiguity as a testimony to the reality that all human beings are far more than types. This play proclaims to us that all of us are more than types, more than fixed figures from the scorn of times. That ability to change and that complexity is what makes us human. The capacity for grand but varying passions and identities, indeed, adds complexity and individuality to the characters and to us. Shakespeare, in this last moment, when Othello explodes out from the stereotypes that are imposed upon him 
and he's recognized as being great at heart, attempting, grappling, struggling to d overcome the animal part of himself and to kill it, to leave behind something else of himself that can't be understood and that can't really be reconciled or neutralized by a single reductive story. Shakespeare reclaims Othello from Iago's narrative and from reduction itself. In so doing, he triumphs not only over Iago, but over reductive narratives generally. He presents to us the very purpose of storytelling, its redemptive potential, its ability to expand the human condition, to grant us empathy and understanding, to connect with others, and to overcome and destroy the kinds of, well, reductive visions of the world that are embodied in Iago. This too is a reversal, but it's not a kind of tragic reversal. Quite the opposite, it's a triumphant one. Shakespeare overturns expectations, expectations for a genre of tragedy, and for a black man, who Shakespeare proclaims wholeheartedly is a man. As Othello is reduced in status and command, nobility and authority, as he loses his public personhood, his recourse to language and his place among equals, he's also redeemed and saved. By reducing Othello to his base animal being, and then having re him reclaim his humanity, Shakespeare saves him from reduction. That is, from reductive readings of his character as a personification of nobility or villainy. Both exist within him. The character's protean, changeable nature prevents him from being perfect or wholly evil. Othello has the capacity to change and to negotiate between good and evil, savagery and humanity, nobility and villainy. Consequently, he cannot be read in a reductive fashion. By embodying all of these things, he cannot be anything less than a fully human being. In this, I think, we see Shakespeare's objective, his argument about the purpose of storytelling. Storytelling for Desdemona and Othello binds them together. It grants them a greater understanding of their shared humanity and a kind of compassion, empathy, and pity for the other. That too, Shakespeare tells us, is the very purpose of storytelling. It carries us on. It allows us to be discussed and remembered inside a community, but it also gives us insight into the lives and the identities and the common humanity of other people. One more video is going to be posted in this playlist, wherein I will go over the instructions for the final essay assignment. You can expect that to be posted early next week.